Hi, thanks for joining us at JCI Live Austin, Texas, USA. This is the last program of our season, the spring season, I guess it is. And next Sunday we'll begin our live uh, summer or spring season. What we're going to start doing is we have some time in between our, this one, we're going to uh, have a little bit of time, like 30 minutes before that we don't really have to do anything. So we thought we would record some extra programs or videos and maybe some songs that will air hopefully on Mondays, like at 530 uh, on top of our live section, just because we just have the studio time and uh, just wanted to give some more information to our Christian audience here in Austin. One of the things that we just uh, had videos of that is pre recorded is Ted Cruz was on KUSI News and he talks about some of the current issues. And then we had a video of the Texas team, of the Texas Convention of States. You can go to conventionofstates.com to get more information. But it's like a 10 minute vid video of some of the Texas senators and House of Representatives that are talking about what's going on for the Article 5 Convention of the States that's going on, that Texas has approved and many of the states are now going before their government their state uh, government teams and seeing if they want to be part of this Article 5. I think we need 35 of 50 states to actually have a convention of the states. So we'll get more information of that. And um, right now I want to talk about George Soros and what his goal is to destroy America by funding organizations that want to cause destruction instead of unity and I have this three minute video that I found just a current one of what's going on and how he is trying to cause uh, destruction instead of unity here in the, the United States. Organizations funded by the billionaire hedge fund manager George Soros appear to be making a coordinated effort to oppose Convention of States. These organizations include Common Cause and Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, both bankrolled by Soros. My name is Anthony Gutierrez. I represent uh, Common Cause Texas. My name is Ted Bettner. I'm the executive director of the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy. How would delegates be chosen? Uh, how does the delegate selection process work? What rules would govern their decision making? Uh, what are the, the rules for voting? Who decides what is germane? Who settles these disputes? The only constitutional convention in history in 1787 went far beyond its mandate. Uh, that convention went far beyond the scope of what it was intended to do. And, and it also ignored the ratification process. And they also didn't uh, uh, adhere to the ratification. Uh, these two organizations are among an alliance of Soros groups mobilizing against Convention of States. And now, Professor David Super has emerged as the top public attacker of Convention of States. Super is a Georgetown Law professor who served as general counsel to Soros' Center on Budget and Policy Priorities and has recently published numerous op-eds in major publications attacking Convention of States. Until recently, Super had spent his entire legal career with no apparent interest in Article 5. The American framers gave us Article 5 as a tool for we the people to propose the proper kinds of constitutional reforms to rein in federal overreach. They unanimously agreed to insert a convention of states into the Constitution. Shouldn't this also be unanimous among constitutionally minded representatives? 
We're not backing down, and neither should you. Help us fight back. Contact your state representative today and ask them, whose side are you on? The side of the American founders or George Soros? Sign the petition at cosaction.com and find out how you can be part of a solution that's as big as the problem. Sign the petition at cosaction.com and get as many of your friends and family to do the same. With your full address, your state legislators will know that you really are their constituents in their district. Our success depends on you. So we're inviting you to be part of history. Let's invoke the constitutional solution that's as big as the problem. One thing that I learned from my husband, J. Craig Gandy, is that if the, the name George Soros is is going on with what's go with an event that's being planned you know it's evil because he has even claimed to say he wants to destroy America so we need to be sure that if we're part of an organization that it's not have something to do with George Soros so convention of the states is a great thing that we need to do as we the people Last week, we didn't have a live show because I had a car problem. I had all these flashing lights and brake and check engine and some, uh, I don't know what all, scribbly lines. And I said, this is just scary. And we are in a scary time, <laughs> just like our, our car might be having problems. Our country's having problems. And when we have those flashing lights coming on, we need to beware. So... We have some videos from the previous week that Ted Cruz, when he was off of the Senate, <clears throat> they took a break for Easter break, and he was busy in Texas visiting San Antonio and Houston, including the Ronald McDonald House and Memorial Hermann Hospital, meeting with patients, families, and health care leaders. Fox 26 Houston News aired his time that he spent there, and the San Antonio 4 News had a clip of his meeting there. So we're going to show those two clips, and we'll be right back. Maybe we'll be right back. <laughs> Candidate spoke one on one with our Greg Rugan, who joins us now in studio with more. Greg. John and Melinda, there is no bigger opponent of Obamacare than Ted Cruz. That's why the junior senator from Texas says he's turned to diplomacy and deal making to head off a GOP disaster. When you serve in the United States Senate and Texas job creation is your highest priority, it's hard to match the backdrop of a brand new 4 million square foot manufacturing plant for pounding home the point. I think failure is not an option. Talking to dozens of Daikin workers in Waller County, Ted Cruz labeled Obamacare the biggest job killer in Texas. A system so debilitating, he's actively morphing from Senate bomb thrower to GOP peacemaker in an effort to reignite repeal of the Affordable Care Act. The role I'm trying to play is bring people together and focus on where do we have common ground, on repealing Obamacare. Speaking one-on-one -on -one with Fox 26, Senator Cruz says the transformation from partisan naysayer to compromise-seeking negotiator comes easily given his years of settling legal disputes and the respect he's built among like-minded conservatives who recently brought down the House plan. And you've got to say, all right, where is common ground? What is the core thing you want? What's the core thing you want? How can we get to yes and get it done? With Republicans in control of both Congress and the White House, Cruz says his most compelling argument remains the politically catastrophic cost of squandering the rare combination of power and opportunity. Now our job is to deliver on the promises we made. Switching gears on the issue of the ongoing investigations of the Trump administration, Cruz said he believes the Russia concerns are overstated by Democrats and some in the media looking to damage the president with hoopla.
Texas Senator Ted Cruz as he met with small business owners here about the future success of their businesses. News for San Antonio's Amanda Weber is live downtown at Mitierra where they had a luncheon today. Amanda? That's right, Randy. That luncheon just wrapping up a couple hours ago. It was a literal and figurative seat at the table with one of our state's top lawmakers for these business owners. A very healthy discussion today about immigration reform and our country's economy. Morris Saidi from Costa Pacifica restaurants. has owned and operated restaurants in the San Antonio area for more than six years. He says the support of the community has kept his business afloat. It's a city that it's it's growing. The people are the nicest. The community is fantastic. One of nearly 50 small business owners who attended today's luncheon with Senator Ted Cruz. He said he's concerned with the discussions of immigration reform and what it could do for his employees and fellow small business owners. We still have not measured the impact because it's going to be, uh, it's still a, a taboo. Everybody is, 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 is speculating about it. There's nothing straightforward about it. Nobody knows exactly how it will impact our industry, but I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people scared. Senator Cruz said today he celebrates legal immigration. He has championed measures to secure the border, reform the legal immigration system, and uphold the rule of law. With believing that we also have to secure the border. Saidi also concerned with the possibility of a debit card swipe fee hike. Well, something that affects every industry would be the debit card uh, swipe fees. They want to double that, double that and remove the cap on it. And it's, it's something that it was high, then we lowered it, and then they just want to double it again, and it would affect every industry. Eliminating regulations like that is what Senator Cruz says will result in success. Small businesses grow when you see regulations under control, taxes under control. The keys to economic growth are tax reform and regulatory reform. If you want to see the economy take off, you reduce the taxes, you simplify the tax code, and you reduce regulations on small businesses and job creators. And Senator Cruz continued his travels heading to Richardson, Texas this evening. Reporting live downtown, Amanda Weber, News 4 San Antonio. The reason Jonathan has a lag around there was my fault. I had wanted to show a couple of weeks ago when we were live of a picture I saw of Ted Cruz and President Trump laughing when he was signing one of the bills that Ted Cruz had introduced. And it was one of my favorite pictures. They're just, they're so happy. And it reminded me of what Ted Cruz said, how he is at the happiest point of his life because they're actually doing something as a senator writing bills and stuff that are making a big difference and uh, it's just wonderful to see what he is doing for us the people on other news senator ted cruz was on fox news with uh, tucker carlson on the l <clears throat> excuse me el chapo bill that Te senator ted cruz has introduced and this is to help build the wall so enjoy this 6 minute video Border wall President Trump proposed one man trying to fix the impasse is Senator Ted Cruz of Texas. He just introduced the Ensuring Lawful Collection of Hidden Assets to Provide Order Act, El Chapo for short, named in honor of the infamous Mexican drug lord. The bill would use any assets seized from drug lords to finance the construction of the border wall. Senator Cruz joins us now. Senator, good to see you. Tucker, good to see you. Congratulations just, on the new show, by well, the way. Thank you. The obvious question is why are you? one of the president's bitterest political enemies during the primaries, taking the lead in helping to fulfill one of his basic campaign promises. Why has it fallen to you? Where's everybody else? Well, listen, that was then, this is... Well, I know, but... We, like, we, we had a vigorous primary, but right now, we've got an historic opportunity. We have a Republican president, we have Republican heads of every agency, right? we have Republican majorities in both Congress. I am spending every waking moment, night and day, working to help lead the fight to let's deliver on our promises. Let's do what we said. But why is no one else doing that? Well, I, look, I, I hope we see more Republicans stepping forward to do it. When it comes to the border wall, this is a common sense issue. I represent Texas. We've got 1,200 miles of border with, tech, with Mexico, and we have got to secure the border. We have promised the American people if you elect us, we will do that. And I think we need to honor that promise.
I just, again, for the third time, because I'm, I'm marveling at this, you would think that, that more in your position in the Senate would have the same attitude, but they don't. They're against the border walls. You know, many of your colleagues, the Republicans, are against it. Why do you think they're against it? Uh, well, you know, as you know, the Democrats right now are threatening to shut down the government to try to stop the border yes. funding. Um, I, and I think that just shows how radical they are. And I hope and believe this new administration will follow the, follow the promise and build the border wall. What I tried to do with this legislation I introduced yesterday was provide a funding stream. And, and El Chapo, as you know, notorious drug lord, leader of the Sinaloa drug cartel, uh, is in U.S. custody. He's being, he's being prosecuted. And the, the federal government has initiated civil forfeiture actions. His fortune is estimated at $14 billion. Now, it so happens, coincidentally, that the, the estimated cost of the wall is between 14 and $20 billion. So the legislation I filed yesterday was very simple. It said any proceeds that are forfeited from El Chapo and from other drug lords shall be spent building the wall and securing the border. And, and i got to say, Tucker, that there's a justice to that in that these drug cartels are the ones crossing the border with impunity, smuggling drugs, smuggling narcotics, engaged in human trafficking. They're the ones violating our laws, and it's only fitting that their ill-gotten gains fund securing the border. The cost of a border wall is relatively low yeah. compared yeah. to a lot of other yeah. government programs. So when you hear its opponents on mm -hmm. both sides mm -hmm. cite cost as a reason to right. oppose it, what's your reaction? Ah, listen, that's a fig leaf. That's, that's not the reason they oppose it. The opponents of the border wall oppose it from the Democratic side because they support illegal immigration. Yeah. It, it is very simple. You know, back in January, I was down in McAllen on the Texas border, and, and, and I joined the, the midnight muster before the midnight border patrol went out. And I got to say, I visited with about 150 Border Patrol agents. The relief these men and women had at the election results, it was palpable. They were so frustrated at having spent eight years in an administration where their political superiors, you know, imagine you're out there risking your life, apprehending violent cartels, traffickers. You bring them in and your political superiors process them through, release them, and the next day you're out catching the same guys all over again. They were frustrated out of their minds. Imagine how demoralizing yeah, that is. It would drive you insane. And what's astonishing is in the first couple of months of this new administration, illegal immigration has already dropped more than 50 percent. Now, Tucker, if back in the fall and if in August or September, October, we were to say elect a Republican who will enforce the law and illegal immigration will drop 50 percent before we build a mile of wall, before we hire another Border Patrol agent, the mainstream media would have ridiculed that claim, would have said, that is loony. Yeah. And, and I asked the agents, I it said, right, what's happened. changed? And they said, the only thing that's changed is the cartels understand, now we have an administration that will enforce the law. That matters. It's totally true. Really quick, last question, I can't resist. The name is brilliant and hilarious. <laughs> you actually came up with an acronym that spells El Chapo. Who thought of that? Uh, it, it's it's a, f a fellow on, on my staff. Sean is his name. He's smart. He's talented. And I, I already told him, I, I said it was brilliant. And I didn't come up with it. But when I saw it, I laughed out loud and said, we're going with that. That's fabulous. All right. If Sean ever wants a job in TV, have him, have him call me. <laughs> Thanks, Senator. Great to see you. Up next, Bill Nye. Great bills. Great bill, Senator Ted Cruz. Thank you so much for what you are doing for us. Well, it's already been 20 minutes, and most of what I just shared with you was Ted Cruz news. That's why I'm going to do extra time before we go live to share some of these. Sometimes I could do a whole hour program of just the things that Senator Ted Cruz is doing as our Texas senator. I'm going to do a movie review today on Collateral Beauty that we watched a couple of weeks ago. Will Smith plays a businessman who loses his daughter to a rare disease and becomes so overwhelmed with grief that he loses his wife and business is about to go under. He writes letters to death, time, and love. It's a heart-wrenching story that will open your heart to love after grief. Was it the holidays? Uh, no, it wasn't that. Well, then why you decide to come in tonight? Um, I'm trying to fix my mind. Howard is a brilliant man, and he's not just a boss, he's a friend. 
He lost his child, and now he doesn't care if he loses everything else. This might be the strangest thing I have ever come across. He writes letters. Who are they to? Howard doesn't write letters to people. He writes to things. Time. Love. Death. Kids write letters to Santa Claus. It doesn't mean they're crazy. No, this is therapeutic. You don't think I'm crazy, but I'm having conversations. Death came first. She met me in the dog park. Charmed, I'm sure. So death is a her. Turns out death is an elderly white woman. Remember me? I'm time. You wrote me because you need me. Howard? Ask her. Go ahead, ask her if she can see me. He was sitting right here. And he just appeared, right? I'm love. And I'm the fabric of life. Something's starting to happen to you. Howard? I don't know what to do to bring you back. What if love, death, and time are trying to help you? You need to talk to them, Howard. Challenge them. Just engage. Love is the reason for everything. I felt you every day when she laughed. And you broke my heart. I was there in her love. But I'm also here now in your pain. He's reaching out to the cosmos for answers. Just be sure to notice the collateral beauty. It's the profound connection to everything. He accepts that. Maybe he gets to find his life again. You're not here to take me, are you? No, Howard. I'm here to ride the F train with you. Let's love tonight. The movie really touched me. And I think that a lot of that is because of the grief that I had when I lost my husband in 2014. And I had a brain aneurysm just four months after that because I'm sure it was because of just the stress and the, just the grief that I had. Even though I'm a daughter of God and loved God with all my heart, some things here in, on earth can just be overwhelming. This next video I just watched recently from May of 2014 of my husband, J. Craig Gandy. He talks about abortion and how human touch helps with brain development. And he also tells us about how we're battling in the spirit. And it's just a great video. It's a 30-minute video here, but I know that my audience will enjoy listening to his words of wisdom. And Jonathan, we're going to start at 2.05. You might have just a few minutes to uh, put it to that point. And thank you again for tuning. We'll be back in about 30 minutes. My name's Craig Gandy, and thank you for joining me this evening. Gorgeous day here in Austin, Texas. Uh, I could have just sat out in the sunshine and enjoyed it all day. Uh, fortunately, I was busy most of the day, and then we came up to the studio, but it sure was pretty outside. It's cool weather has been nice for this time of the year and the rains that we have. We could use a lot more, but it sure was nice. And I was thinking the other day, as I was, my mind has tended to wander, you know, at times, uh, especially at my age, you uh, um, sometimes a little harder to stay focused as it was when I was young. But I was looking across a, a room filled with uh, a lot of women. And I looked at them and I thought, you know, whether it's, 10 or 100 or 250, 500,000 women. It doesn't matter how many women there, that are in a room or in a location. Do you know one out of three, average, one out of three of those women has had an abortion? That's a lot of broken women. That's a lot of people that are hurting. A lot of broken people. And then I got to thinking just tonight as I was, as I was thinking about the, the women, I got thinking, you know, uh, there are more women in the United States than there are men. Actually, more women in the world than there are men. And I thought, well, if one out of three women have been affected by abortion, that's at least one out of three men that have been affected by abortion too, whether actively involved in the decision or... Uh, 
a bystander as that decision was made without him. Some men haven't even participated in, don't even know about it. But there are many that do and have gone through that brokenness too. So there's a lot of broken men and broken women out there. You know, as we start to share and start to give love and start to realize that the only way that we can be healed from these type of atrocities is through the blood of Jesus. Knowing that what he's done on the cross has bought forgiveness for us. You know, as we give hugs straight from the heart of the Father into those that we share love with. And I, I read something today that about, it was kind of interesting. It was saying that the touch, human touch, is important to brain development. Said that if we touch, put our hands on someone, that touch is important to the development of our brain. You know, they've proven in studies with babies that babies that are touched and held and loved comparable to babies that are just left alone, those babies that receive human touch are healthier and happier and smarter and prettier and on and on and on just from human contact, just from touch. We know that when we share hugs of love with one another, that it changes the hearts of those around us. You know, a lot of times when we smile at somebody and they smile back, or God tells you to give someone a hug, and you give them a hug, and you see the difference that it makes in their life, you see how God uses you to affect change, to share his love with someone that needs it. You know, there's, I guess it was early 2009, the Lord had really been pushing into the Lord's presence, really seeking Him hard. Had for about a year and a half on a every moment of every day kind of basis seeking God. But I'd finally reached a stage of breakthrough. There was, as I would lift my hands in praise, I would see a, a sliver in the sky. And as I would try to open that sliver in the spirit, it wouldn't, I, I couldn't reach it. So then one Saturday night, we were at a uh, prophet's get together, uh, singing to the Lord. And as I reached up, that sliver became a circle. And it was a circle with stars in it. It was like an open expanse of heaven with stars shining out of this circle in the sky. So the next morning in church, as I was once again singing unto the Lord, had my hands lifted, the Lord just spoke to my spirit and said, those stars are his glory that he's wanting to reign into the hearts of his children. These are the times that as we push in to the purposes of God, as we believe for the promises that he's promised to us, as we give of ourselves to one another through love and smiles and hugs, we will see a change in his children that will affect eternity. You know, as we know that human touch changes brain cells. It grows brain cells. So if we know that human touch affects our brain, it affects the way we think, then we want to shower those that we care about with as much human contact as possible. Not touches of lust, but touches of love. To let them know of the love of God. To let them know that these hugs, this human touch is stimulating the brain to fire on all cylinders, to get excited about the things of God. Pray over one another, love one another, hug one another, and see what God does to increase the brain 
functioning to receive all the wisdom that he has to offer. These are good days ahead for those that love the Lord. Know that if you've been through any kind of brokenness, any type of hurt or harm, know that to go through the atrocity of an abortion, male or female, that there is forgiveness at the foot of the cross. Jesus bought our forgiveness when he died on the cross. That when people say we're washed in the blood of the Lamb, that's what they mean. All we have to do is freely receive the gift that Jesus gave, and that's the gift of forgiveness. We receive his forgiveness and forgive ourselves and find someone to love on us, to hold us, cry together, share love together, share hugs and human touch, and be healed by the blood of the Lamb. You know, God has really been stressing to me to pray more, to pray in tongues especially. Huh? It's been a long time since I've prayed in tongues on TV. I think it was 2009, right after we'd, one of the first programs we did, where I shared prayer and speaking in tongues. And Mario doesn't like the idea of, of praying in tongues. So we have a lot of people out there that uh, don't believe in praying in tongues, don't believe in, um, um, just don't believe in it. You know, I don't want to, some people say, I don't want to pray in tongues, and I don't want anybody to pray in tongues around me. Uh, some people don't believe that it's from God. You know, I was, for a long time, I had a, people would tell me, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I knew that wasn't true because I had too many gifts of the Spirit that, uh, like the Spirit of discernment and, um, and other gifts that I knew were from God. But speaking in tongues at one time was not. But I asked God for that gift after an elder in my church at the time when we were in clean. This was 1991, uh, he said, or 92. He told me, he said, if a person doesn't speak in tongues, they're not filled with the Holy Spirit. And I thought, well, I, I like my pastor. I like people in church. I don't necessarily agree with the elder, but I'll ask God about it because I want to ensure that if this is a gift that God's willing and freely gives, um, you know, I like gifts from God. So I prayed about it. I you know, bought a book from the bookstore uh, on how to speak in tongues. I uh, read this book, and it was a pretty simple book. It said, for any gift you ask from God, you just ask him. And you receive by faith. And you open your mouth, and you utter one word. And if it's time for God to fill you with the Spirit, you don't have to be in church. You don't have to be anywhere. You can just be sitting at home on your living room couch and open your mouth in faith and go, ah, or ooh, or whatever. And uh, God will fill you with gift of tongues. Now, I prayed about this, and I prayed hard. I said, Lord, I said, if this is a gift you want to give me, I want to receive it. And I, after all the kids had gone to bed, and Mari had gone to bed, about 10 o'clock at night, 10.30, 11 o'clock, it was a pretty late bunch at the time. And uh, I said, Lord, I said, if this is a gift you'd like to give me, I'd like to receive it. And I went, ah, and he filled my mouth with tongues. For six hours, I prayed in tongues. The only time that I've ever, this has ever occurred like this since 1991 is the Lord would run a ticker tape. A ticker tape's kind of like a, a stock market tape where they would uh, show you the different stock market, uh, you know, buy and sell things. And uh, but if this ticker tape would run across my mind, run, and it would be like, "This is what we're going to pray for," and we would pray, and it would be new tongues that he would, that we would use to God and I would use to pray for that particular issue. Now, as we prayed. There was one at the close to the end of the prayer of six hours. God said, Now we're going to pray for Jesus on the cross. And I thought, We had, didn't even have time to think because we immediately went into prayer. This was new tongues, and this was a overwhelming 
feeling of grief that penetrated my, my spirit, where then I rolled up almost in a ball with an anguish coming from inside me, a, a pain, a grief that just welled out from within me from what Jesus had suffered on the cross for us. And then we finished that prayer, and we prayed for something else, another ticker tape, and we prayed for something else. The next day, I'd ask the Lord about it. I said, Lord, I said, I don't understand. I said, I don't understand why we prayed for Jesus on the cross. I don't understand how the prayer effect that I prayed last night could have made any difference to Jesus 2,000 years ago. It made no sense to me. And the Lord just spoke to my spirit just the same as I'm speaking to you right now. He said, Craig, he says, the way I look at eternity, the way I look at life, the way I look at everything, he says, you as a man look at each day as a page in a book, day one, day two, day three. And so we look at, as, as our, at our life or at all of creation, all, all of time, we look at as a page going da 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 And God said, but what I do is he says, I look at it all as a picture on a wall, the beginning and the end. He said, what I see is I see the beginning and I see the end and I see everything in between. He says, and that's the way God looks at everything. And so it made sense. It still is kind of hard to grasp, but my limited thinking with my small brain probably need more touch and more hugs. But I, uh, it, it started to make sense that what God wants us to do is to pray over everything, pray over everything, because he wants us to, first of all, in the word it says that prayer is incense, sweet-smelling incense to the nostrils of God. Now, if we know that and we want to get into his presence and we want to get in there smelling good, then we pray. We pray. We pray. We pray. You know, it was a number of years ago, I guess 2009, 2008, that the Lord shared with me warfare tongues. Now, these were new tongues, but they were tongues to speak to the heavens. These were tongues to slam the heavens. These were tongues to battle in heavenly places. Now, if we know our battle is not with one another, and there's too many times that people think that our fight is with one another, uh, white with black or black with brown or brown with Asian or all of us fighting one another because one of us is uglier than the other one or one of us is prettier than the other or we want to be ugly. It's not what it's about at all. All of these normally are demonic attacks stirring up the ugliness it can find to cause the fighting. Now, if we know our battle is in the heavens, if we know that the majority of attacks we receive from small-minded people, from either usually small-minded people that are operating out of their own bigotry, their own brokenness, their own greed or envy or selfishness, is all demonic attack. Now, if you know that, am I going to get mad at somebody because they've got a ugly mouth? Am I going to get mad at somebody because they're greedy? Am I going to get mad at somebody because they're broken from an abortion and want to attack someone that's pro-life? No, of course not. My battle is not in the flesh. My battle is in the spirit. So if my battle's in the spirit, how do I war? I war in the spirit. I war through in speaking in tongues. Now, if I'm praying for people in this region, like I've been praying for a long time. On TV, when I pray for the health of my friends, like Glenna Faith last week, or a uh, friend's sister, or my son Jeff, or, I, or my friend out of Atlanta, Kathy, when I'm praying for them, or Pokey and his wife, when I'm praying for them, I'm praying in English because that's what my English words are, 
I mean, if I was Spanish or spoke Spanish or, or Italian and spoke Italian or German and spoke German, that would be my natural tongue. That would be what I would be praying, the words that I would be speaking in my natural voice. Now, if I'm speaking in tongues, these are tongues that regardless of what my, nat my natural language is, tongues are what is a communication from me to God. It's a communication from the Spirit within me via the Holy Spirit to God, the Father. Now, if we know that, if we know that tongues is a ministry gift to the body of Christ from God, it's when it's, tongues are spoken in church, normally what God will do is he'll give an interpreter, give someone that will interpret those tongues. If anybody wants to interpret what I pray in tongues, and God gives you an interpretation, then I will ask you to call my cell phone and tell me what he's told you. And Lori or John or Jamie can put that number up on the screen. <coughs> Because I know that God is wanting to release power. He's wanting to release health. He, all creation is eagerly awaiting for those with courage to step to the top of the mountain and speak to the heavens. And God has pressed in my heart in the past couple of weeks that that's what he's wanting me to do. So I'm going to pray until the Lord as tells me to move on. And I, if I, if this is the first time you've heard a person speaking in tongues, don't be afraid. Just, just submit to the Spirit. Allow God to speak to your spirit. Find peace in the blood of Jesus. And know that I'm doing this because I love you. And I love the people of this region. And I love the people throughout the world that believe in our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're living in a time that's harsh, and it's time to arise for the body of Christ to claim their inheritance in Christ Jesus, because these are our days to ride into glory with the King of Kings. Holy Father, I'm Belalahutin de Baba Bahatin dish Belalaha, and Belalahutin de Baba Bahatin de Dibehe. Ambalalaha, <laughs> my Father, bless my friends. Bless those that are watching. Bless those in their homes. Bless those in this region. Bless our friend in Atlanta. Bless all the friends we have throughout the world, Lord. Lord, I lift them to you and ask your favor and your blessings over the ministries in India and Pakistan, Bangladesh, all throughout Africa, Lord. Touch the people that love you, Lord. Bless their ministries, Lord, ministering to the widows and the orphans. And Lord, bless them. Bless them with the provision they need to further your kingdom throughout eternity, Lord. And I thank you for providing that provision, Lord. I thank you for healing those that are sick. And I thank you for making those that are weak strong, Lord. I thank you for blessing us with wisdom, Lord. 
wisdom to affect eternity for your kingdom, Lord Jesus. And I thank you. I thank you for calling us into service for you, Lord. I thank you for allowing us to be yours, Lord. I thank you, Jesus, for all you've done. And I thank you, Father, for allowing Jesus to endure such pain and shame and degradation and everything he endured, Lord. I know it was hard, Father. And I thank you for allowing that so that you could receive our love and we could receive yours. And I thank you, Jesus, for all you've done for us and for our Father in heaven. And I thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to empower us, to teach us all things. Thank you for the Word, for the Holy Bible, Lord, to comfort us, to teach us, to guide us, Fill us with your peace, Lord. We love you, Lord Jesus, and I thank you, Lord Jesus, and I bless you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Father. We love you, Holy Spirit. We love you, Lord Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, you know, <clears throat> it feels good to pray. <laughs> I don't know. I just sometimes, I pray about everything, you know. I guess it's a good thing about driving an old truck or, you know, you get up in the morning to pray, you pray over your house, you pray over your kids and your wife and your animals and your car and your friends and family and grandkids and, you know, you could pretty well spend a pretty good portion of your day praying. And I think that's why God says just pray all the time. It's, uh, it makes you feel good, for one thing. You're, it's kind of like you're just chatting with God. And, uh, and that's a good thing. You know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, loving on your, your wife or, or kids or, you know, dogs or cats, you know, when, they, when you just have someone to love, someone to pet or, or hold or kiss or, you know, Esther got me yesterday with a little nip on the cheek, you know, and I, uh, you know, I love those animals. I love the love they give to me. And, uh, you know, and God loves that kind of love that we give to him too, the same as we love the love he gives to us. You know, these are good days. Ahead. The Lord turned me to Ephesians tonight. Well, he's first turned me to Acts, Acts 20, 26, 14. When I was thinking about the women with the, and men that have been a part of the one of three that is a part of the abortion, and that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people that have been hurt through abortion. Where we find healing is at the foot of the cross. The blood of the Lamb is where we find forgiveness and healing. But in Acts 26, 20, 26, 14, it says, and when, this is Paul now talking, and that's kind of cool, Paul. I'll start it off in, in Acts. And I, I want more to have a chance to come out and show off her T-shirt. And, but, uh, so it says in Acts that Paul was, um, beginning says, that Luke was an associate of Paul, but it was, um, oh, well, this is, let me, let me start this. This is, this is 2615 or 2614. It says, when we'd all fallen, had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language. And this is Paul recounting his conversion, how God had touched him. He said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins 
an inheritance and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. You know, a lot of times the choices we make are the sins that we live with forever for some people. You know, I came across a, a lady that just the other day that we got to talking about, uh, you know, this past summer, the, the prayer thing. And, and this could have been what precipitated me thinking about the one in three women. And probably was. I hadn't even thought about that. But uh, we got to talking, and she said, yeah, she said it was such a hullabaloo at the Capitol. She said her parents got home. They uh, ended up you know, immediately writing a check to Planned Parenthood, a big check, too, because they were just so upset at Governor Perry and da-da-da-da. I said, well, you know the purpose behind that. What, the only thing was just cleanliness of facilities trying to ensure that a woman going in for an abortion had the same type of clean facility as she would have if she was going in for dental surgery or any other kind of surgery or any other kind of medical procedure, just wanting to have a cleanliness of facility and have the safety issues for the women covered. She said, well, I, I, I said, you know, there's so many women that have had an abortion, that they're broken. The brokenness that comes through an abortion. I said, and these women just need to be loved on. That's all the pro-life movement's about. It's not to be mean or ugly to anybody. If you didn't see anybody at the Capitol wearing a blue shirt that was mean or ugly to anybody, we were, they were trying to share love. It's not about judging or criticizing or you know, trying to shame someone that's had an abortion. And there are people, there's... We're going to miss... Okay. So I want to show this new ad that was a pro-life ad. And uh, we'll see you next week after this ad. like to ask you a question. Why didn't you even let me play football? I would have been the happiest child in the world with a ball. I would not have asked you for much more. If you would have come to fetch me up at school by surprise, go to the cinema, or... I don't know, go and have a pizza on Fridays, or go for a ride on a weekend. I didn't want anything special. Why didn't you let me go out with my friends? Or let me have a girlfriend? You would have loved her. Why didn't you let me have a life to be born? to do it. It was out of fear.
La idea surge de una amiga que cada vez que ve a alguno de mis hijos, pues eh, reacciona. Esto sería una especie de recuerdo parecido al síndrome de aniversario. Evitar un aborto es, en el fondo, querer a alguien. Bueno, en el fondo y en la superficie es querer a alguien. Acostumbrado al teatro, cuando se trabaja en cámara hay que hacerlo todo mucho más, más chiquitito. ¿no? Todas esas emociones que quizás son más fáciles de exagerar o, o sobreactuar, aquí hay que hacerlo todo más, más reducido, más, más compacto. La primera impresión que tuve cuando conocí a mi madre ficticia es que físicamente se parece más a mi propia madre. He intentado no, no entrar en la ética del asunto, simplemente pensar en el papel de la mujer, que, de la persona que lo está pasando mal por algo, que tiene miedo. Y buscar reconciliación con ella misma. Que sepan que hay alguien que les apoya, que no están solas.